Joshua. Yes, Anne. You know, I see the invite was saying 11 to 12. It was it was an error. Mm. Um, but since people had already registered, let's just proceed because um, if we don't, yeah, uh, the people who registered, they will end up, you know, joining and then you leave have, uh, you, they will join and leave. And remember, most people use their calendar. So when you register, you receive the calendars. I'm very sure that most of them were using their calendars. All right, no problem. Okay, yeah. So let's just uh, wait until 10, they join, and then we get started. Um, okay. And then I think um, I, I can bring in the use cases around 11 when people are joining. Most of yeah. those maybe are using the flyer. Those who are using yes. the flyer to join. Yeah. All right. But everyone who registered received 10. Okay. Okay.
Good morning, uh, ladies and gentlemen. Thank you for taking time to join uh, today's webinar. We are waiting for one more speaker and then uh, we can get started. So we should be starting shortly, maybe in the next two minutes. So kindly bear with us as uh, the other speaker joins so that we get started. All right, we shall get started in the interest of time so that um, we're able to save on time. Um, the speaker is having a bit of uh, technical challenges, but once they join, of course, um, they will continue from where we'll have started. So allow me to introduce um, our guest speaker for the day, um, Anne, who is uh, a seasoned legal profession, uh, a professional and an expert in uh, legal compliance. Um, Anne has uh, over 17 years of experience and is an advocate of the High Court, who and also as well as uh, a managing partner at Muti Advocates, um, a, a firm that specializes in corporate legal compliance services. And she has a track record of developing compliance programs uh, for clients across diverse industries. While we are focusing on healthcare for this session, meaning um, she's also able to, you know, give insights in uh, healthcare, um, but has largely done work in education, financial services, hospitality, logistics, e-commerce, energy, insurance, and as well as healthcare. Her expertise uh, lies in providing strategic legal counsel on commercial matters, including data protection, uh, corporate law, intellectual property employment law and risk management. Um, of, she has also uh, been highly regarded as a corporate trainer and facilitated numerous seminars, workshops and training programs on corporate law compliance and uh, equipping professionals and executives with practical knowledge and uh, guidance. So for those uh, who are looking for such services, um, definitely we have the right person uh, to be able to take us through that. And as a thought leader in the field and uh, actively contributes to the legal publication, publications, industry forums uh, and conferences, 
And of course, um, hindsight on emerging trends and best practices ensures that participants uh, within uh, the forums that she contributes to received up to date guidance. And um, we are lucky to have and take us through, you know, what data protection and privacy looks like within the healthcare space and within the context of um, merging the health, the industry of um, insurance and healthcare. So, without uh, further ado, um, Anne, you're welcome. Um, over to you to share with us um, the wealth of, you know, infinite wisdom that uh, you have. Ah, or also Timona has joined us. Um, allow me to introduce Timona um, as well. Um, so Timona is, um, you know, is specializing in IT security. So he's an IT and resilience risk expert. Um, and of course has been at this um, for the last 20 years. So he has 20 years of diverse experience in uh, system development, IT infrastructure, risk management, and project management. Um, and uh, of course, he brings a unique blend of skills and knowledge and experience to um, a wide range of clients to help them improve their processes and manage their processes better. Um, and also enhancing in information available for decision making to support achievement of strategic objectives for organizations. Um, he has also uh, regularly assisted clients in designing and developing implementation um, of individual uh, group credit, life and medical systems in uh, Kenya, Rwanda and Zambia. So that's quite um, a wealth of experience there. Uh, conducting risk assessments of systems, mobile applications, websites for compliance with data protection and, of course, security uh, and identifications of risks within um, IT infrastructure, um, planning and securing the threat landscape within the network. So he has also served as a um, manager IT and resilience risk at uh, AR Insurance Kenya. And, but as um, I had mentioned earlier, he has had uh, several stints in Rwanda and Zambia, which of course gives him uh, quite uh, an amount of uh, experience when it comes to um, data protection and privacy, uh, not just in Kenya, but in those respective countries. So welcome Timona um, and welcome Anne. Over to you, Anne and Timona, so that um, you can speak to us the gospel. We are ready to listen. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Joshua. I like how you are saying uh, we preach. Let me uh, share my screen. Uh, Joshua, you can just let me know if you can see it on your end. Yes, I can see it. Uh, put in presentation. Oh, yeah, now it's in presentation mode. You can proceed. Thank you very much. And thank you to everyone who has uh, joined the webinar. We hope that you will be able to pick a thing or two that you can implement in your various uh, compliance strategies. So we are looking into five key things in this uh, section. We're going to introduce the concept of data protection. We are then going to define some of the key terms that you hear uh, when you are interacting with this area. We will look at the healthcare sector, how it's characterized and the risks that uh, are most pressing from a privacy perspective. Then we will look at the general obligations of controllers and processors and finalize with an implementation roadmap. I'll be supported by Timona as we present and go through the, the sections. So as an introduction, I think the best place to start with this topic is always to ask yourself, what is data protection? What does it entail or what does it deal with? When we talk about data protection, really, uh, we are talking about safeguarding of personal data or um, data relating to individuals. So uh, it concerns it concerns individuals or people in their individual capacity, and it is imposed upon organizations. So when you hear data protection, it's imposed upon organizations or persons that process personal data. So if you are an organization acting as a, an entity or a corporate entity uh, that deals with data protection, then um, you would be expected, I mean, sorry, that handles personal data, you would be expected to comply with the Data Protection Act. 
Similarly, if uh, you are an individual or handling in a, a person's information in an individual capacity, uh, there could be there could be obligations that are imposed upon you when you're handling that uh, kind of data. I like to give the example of a house uh, nanny or a nanny in the house. Those are uh, situations where you deal with an individual, you employ them in an individual capacity most times. And when you're handling their data, in that situation, you could be imposed uh, with data protection obligations in relation to their information. When we talk about the how of data protection, how do we achieve it and when do we achieve it? We achieve data protection from the moment that we collect data. We're expected to protect data from the moment we collect it to the point of disposal. How we do it is through different frameworks. We can do it through what the law says, uh, we can also have some imposed industry standards or also have some security frameworks, uh, internationally or globally accepted frameworks for protecting uh, data. You're expected to protect data everywhere where you process it. So whether it's uh, electronically or through manual filing systems. And the overarching reason why we protect data is so that we can promote a person or an individual's right to privacy. <clears throat> so the concepts of data protection and the right to privacy are closely related. They are similar, but not the same. Uh, privacy is much wider, while data protection kind of tends to deal with personal data or information relating to a person. But privacy can extend beyond somebody's information to other aspects of their human being or their being but the two concepts are closely related. When we look at the historical origins of data protection, if you have to trace where this uh, concept starts, it starts really with the idea of privacy. Uh, actually started discussions, uh, sometimes people say even from biblical times, the idea of a private life uh, was always stressed so that when Adam and Eve were caught out uh, in the Garden of Eden, for those of you who may be practicing the Christian faith, and they had to hide, that was the beginning of the notion of privacy. They felt that something was wrong and they, they needed to be in a private space. But we also have uh, early philosophers like Aristotle, uh, who have dis who discussed the existence of what we call a public space or a public sphere of life and a private uh, sphere of life. So they had debates and uh, arguments around there should be an individual should have what is public, uh, known in the public and what is private uh, to them. And then the discussion started to move towards a legal, started to take a legal angle as we uh, look at the Hippocratic Oath, which is what the doctors take, which was taken around 400 uh, BC. Then we have uh, the recognition of a right to privacy or a right to be let alone, which was introduced in the common law in the UK and uh, Commonwealth countries. And then we also have it in the US as the right to be let alone. So the discussions began that way. There should be some form of privacy. There should be some form of things that are not known to all the public. And th that right should be uh, protected. But as we moved into the 20th century, which is from uh, the 1900s, um, this is when we really started to see a development in data protection um, and also in the laws of privacy. We begin in 1948 when the Declaration of Human Rights uh, was declared uh, following World War II. Article 12 then uh, entrenched a right to private life a right to private life. Uh, so every person has a right to private life. It is usually read with uh, the International Covenant on Civil and Political Rights, which also gives a right to private life. So basically, these two are human rights. They've been entrenched in many of the constitutions around the world, and many of them, including in our various jurisdictions within East Africa, recognize that an individual has a right to privacy. However, discussions on data protection uh, started to move away from the human rights angle 
and start to take a tangent of their own from the 1970s onwards, uh, mostly because of the increased use of computers, computing technology, and the invention of the internet. So before 1970s, most of what was happening was, you know, physically restricted. When we talked about privacy, we restricted it to a physical zone, a physical space you could see. But as time progressed and as computers became common to use and the internet came, concerns started becoming around how is my information or how am I being protected when my information is moving across networks, across organizations to people I cannot physically touch and pick people I cannot physically see. So in response to those concerns, a lot of nations in Europe and the US in between 1970 and 1980 started to formulate their own laws on data protection, much of what we are seeing in Africa. But then they also started to, to notice that each person had a different law and the laws that were coming up were creating confusion in terms of flows of data. There was not, they were restricting the free flow of data across jurisdictions. And so that prompted a need for a regional outlook for data protection or for protection of information across uh, networks. And so the first regional body to actually publish guidelines on protection of pri uh, privacy and trans border flows of data was the uh, organization for uh, for uh, organization of co co and cooperation of economic development or ECD organization of economic development and cooperation then we also have the uh, council of europe uh, in 1981 which came up with what we call the convention 108 uh, they were looking at rules that are specific to europe but they opened up this convention to the rest of the world this was the first internationally binding convention on privacy in the world in 1990 the UN came up with guidelines for regulation of computerized personal data files. Um, so they gave some guidelines which uh, UN member states could entrench in their local laws. Uh, then in 1995, we have the European Union uh, now deciding to go for a more comprehensive framework than what they had in place. This was motivated by the liberalization of the internet. So before 1995, the internet was not available for commercial use, but by 1995, it had become liberalized. And now we had the dot-com generation coming up, bigger and better use of computers, bigger and better technologies, and more and more sharing of personal data is what motivated the first directive from Europe on data protection. Um, in 2005, the uh, Asian countries under the APEC uh, framework came up with their own privacy framework, which was heavily borrowed from the EU data protection uh, framework. Then in 2018, again in the EU, they uh, changed their law. They moved from the data protection directive to what we now call the general data protection regulation of 2018, which is the most universally known, most uh, common, and it actually has found its way to many of the privacy regulations that we see even here in Africa. We also have in 2023, the African Union's uh, convention, also known as the Malabo Convention, which came into force uh, in June last year, uh, when the 15th country has accepted it uh, as part of their of their law, acceded it to it as part of their laws. So it was actually formed in it was actually formulated in 2014, but it only became a binding convention in 2023. So it took quite a long time for it to be accepted. So we see that now, generally, the movement towards regulating data protection in this side of the world started, um, I think, after 2015. From 2015 onwards is when we started to see movement, uh, but a lot of action has happened since the GDPR came. The GDPR provided a framework which most African countries have taken to be a good framework to adopt and put into their local laws. So if you look at many of the laws that we have, including the one we have in Kenya, 
Uganda, um, Rwanda, almost similar provisions, similar obligations, similar requirements around protection of personal uh, data. A f uh, very few, in fact, I don't think uh, I know of any of the East African countries that actually signed up to the Malabo uh, Convention. Uh, and so a lot of them have just decided to take up their own framework and their own laws. So what we have in Africa is each country kind of operating its own law. We don't have a unified way of even discussing how data flows from one country to another. And this, of course, is coming with its own challenges, even as we seek to look for recognition from these uh, Western nations like the EU for recognition of our data protection systems and for uh, permission to transfer data freely between our, our region and uh, regions like the EU. So um, if we look at Kenya, for example, I've uh, just taken this as an example, we have borrowed uh, the GDPR framework, but we have also modeled our data protection law on Article 31 of the Constitution. Everyone has a right to privacy. Uh, then we have the Data Protection Act, which is formed pursuant to the Constitution, uh, which then gives details around protection of personal data based on the right to privacy. Uh, we have some uh, additional regulations that are dealing with specific areas of data protection under the Act. And then we also have piecemeal laws, sectoral laws, uh, insofar as they are not inconsistent with the Constitution or they don't conflict with the Data Protection Act. So basically, the framework in Kenya is modeled on the Constitution, but the law borrows heavily from the uh, GDPR framework most of the things that are found in the Kenyan law will be uh, available in the GDPR. And so is uh, it with these other regions. The things are almost the same. So as we discuss them, we will hear similar concepts. They may be used differently with a little bit of variances, but um, we, have similar go we have similar laws uh, across uh, the countries. Now, in terms of the goal, the ultimate objective of the Data Protection Act, the ultimate objective of data protection laws is to promote accountability. It is to make organizations accountable for the data they collect. They are accountable to the uh, data subject or the person from whom they collect the data. They are accountable in terms of using that data responsibly. They are also accountable to the regulators. They are accountable to their shareholders uh, and the number of spectrum of stakeholders that they could be handling or dealing with. So we want to look at some key words or some key terms that you will hear when we talk about data protection. Uh, and one of these is the term personal data. As you remember, as I said in the introduction, data protection deals with protection of uh, information that can be used to identify an individual, whether directly or indirectly. It's really about can this information point to a named person or can I identify someone from the way the information is placed. So we have very common and typical examples, you know, a bio data, your name, your ID number, your identification uh, data, maybe your date of birth, um, maybe the date of uh, issuance of your passport, your passport number, uh, your contact data, such as your phone number, your email address, those could all be classified as personal data. Then we have commonly within the data protection laws, a subcategorization of laws. So we have laws that, I mean, sorry, a, a subcategorization of personal data. So we have what we call sensitive personal data, which reveals sensitive details about a person. This is where health data comes in, medical records, genetic data, policy information, information about someone's race or ethnic origins or conscious or belief, family details, sex or sexual orientation. It depends. Sensitive data is usually defined in your specific laws. So uh, this is not an exhaustive list. It could be different for the different jurisdictions that we have represented here. But the idea is this type of data 
is usually sensitive or contains information that is more sensitive than the normal uh, information that you would find in public uh, in the public space. And this kind of data requires a higher level of protection. We then have data subject. So the word data subject refers to the person uh, to whom personal data relates. It could be a patient in, in, I'm just going to give examples that are specific to the healthcare sector. So it could be a patient, it could be an insurance policy holder, it could be a doctor, it could be a nurse, uh, it could be a staff member in any of these hospital providing uh, providers so or healthcare providers. So any of that, as long as it is an individual. Uh, that is when it becomes a data subject. So we cannot have SMART as the entity being referred to as a data subject. Typically, most of the data protection laws like to say that they, uh, they, re they, re they re confine themselves to um, definition of data subject to mean a person or an individual or a human being. In some jurisdictions like the EU, uh, dead persons or deceased persons are not referred to as data subjects. They actually go on and clarify that deceased persons are not data uh, subjects. So it's a matter of interpretation based on your law and your jurisdiction. Then we have the term data controller. Uh, so a data controller is a person or organization which uh, jointly or with others determines the purpose and means of processing personal data. Now, um, this can be any type of organization. You have to think wide. As long as an organization picks data and then has determined how it will use the data and why it needs the data, that organization is a controller. So for example, a hospital is a controller. For, for, for the moment you get into a hospital, you have to fill out a uh, maybe a registration form. So the hospital provides you with the means of providing your personal data. And it also says that it needs that registration form for purposes of giving you the health service. If we look at an insurer, the same could apply. So an insurer decides that for you to access a policy or to be able to get a policy benefit, you have to give certain information and that information is given in a certain way, either through a form or a, through a mobile app or through a link on a website or by email. So by making that decision that for you to give me your data, I mean, for me to give you a service, you need to give me your data and you need to give it in a certain way, then that classifies you as a data controller. So it's a matter of interpretation based on the kind of service that you offer for you to determine if you are data controller. In Kenya, we have actually gone a step further and said, if you employ someone, if you're an employer, then you're a data controller. So that makes a lot of the organizations that are in Kenya data controllers. But then we could also have in the healthcare sector, hospitals, insurance providers, uh, pharmaceutical companies, um, claims, uh, sorry, ph pharmaceutical companies could all be uh, data controllers. Then we have the term data processor, and I, I have put smart here deliberately so that we can focus on them to explain that a data processor is an entity that processes uh, data on behalf of the controller. So basically the processor is subcontracted by the controller to carry out a certain aspect of processing. For example, Many of the providers may be represented here, may have onboarded the services of SMART uh, for purposes of claims uh, services or claims processing. So if you have subcontracted your claims processing to SMART, then SMART acts as your data processor. They are your service provider. They are not a controller in, in, uh, in relation to the relationship that you enjoy with them. And so we will look at what it means. Uh, typically in the law, you need to know whether you're a controller or a processor because each have some distinct responsibilities that must be followed through uh, during the processing of data. Finally, you have the term data protection officer 
or DPO. So this is an employee of either the controller or the processor, or it's a, it's, a, it's a consultant or an employee who is appointed to spearhead data protection compliance. So many of you will probably be representing your organizations as DPOs because you have been given that obligation or that responsibility to deal with data protection in that space. So I want to hand over to my colleague, uh, Timona, to take us through the characteristics or the nuances of data protection in the healthcare space. Timona. Oh, th thank you, Anne. And uh, good morning to everyone. This is Francis Timona. So I'll take you through the, the landscape of a health uh, care sector and the uh, different uh, stakeholders who are involved in the provision of uh, health care, uh, that environment. So this is an area where you have uh, multiple stakeholders. Uh, we have the health providers, I believe they are, they are here, the hospital, the pharmacies, then the insurance. These are the ones who actually would uh, bring in the clients so they have some con contracts uh, to, 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 to offer the, the medical. But then, of course, uh, they would sublet that to the health providers. Then uh, we also have the patients themselves. Then also the claim providers, IT providers. Here we are talking of uh, people like Smart. I think we also have uh, MTBA. We have also the telemedicine. In the case of Kenya, we have like Livia. We have Maidawa and all those who connect. Then also payment providers and uh, researcher and analytics here we are talking of probably like the actuarist who would do some bit of data mining just to to model the, the products that uh, the, the customer consumes so there, there are quite a number of uh, stakeholders in this space all of them working together to provide uh, the healthcare. then there's uh, extensive use of data multiple data points so we see most of the health providers, either they are getting this information through SMART or MTBA in the case of Kenya. I don't know for the other people outside Kenya, I think they are equivalent of these providers who would uh, provide this information either through APIs or uh, exchange of data through probably Excel or the, the alternative. So there's a lot of uh, data collection automated uh, procedures like uh, in the case of smart ways through an API and uh, MTBA. So uh, that poses a challenge uh, for you to ponder. And then uh, uh, technology and uh, technology and in innovation. Here, uh, people have moved from the traditional data center where the companies are holding this data and now they are moving this to cloud. Uh, so different uh, organization and different countries would choose either to host it locally or uh, famously on the AWS cloud or maybe on Google, wh whatever you have. Again, there, there, there are issues to look into in terms of data privacy, depending on where you kept your data. Do you have control over that? Then there's also big data. There are people who would uh, doing some data mining and actually analyzing big data. So you also have to be very careful and cognizant of the fact that personal data is also shared. Uh, probably here we would advise a lot of anonymization or, and uh, pseudonymization where you cannot be able to retrace to the person in the case of uh, the analytics. Uh, so quite a number of people would also connect along the space. And then there's the issue of a single patient view. Uh, when the providers are accessing this info, they need to see the history of the client end to end. You need to see the benefits. You need to see the, the history of the patient in terms of uh, the visits and whatever, so that you can make a decision from a point of information. So there's a lot of data there at display to help you make a decision. But then the question would be, who is seeing that is information? Is it fit for, for purpose or are we giving more than what is required? And that means then, would there be a risk? That's a question to ponder. And then also one of the key stakeholder is uh, the regulator. So this is a section that is uh, regulated uh, by law. So basically that's an overview of uh, the healthcare sector. I think we can move. Next, uh,
So uh, along this space, when we look at uh, the keys uh, around this space, so policy processing, and the policy processing, there are quite a number of things that would happen. Uh, first, there's uh, the anti-laundering, uh, anti-fraud and uh, money laundering. Uh, most of uh, the insurance would uh, employ this. They, they would do some bit of profiling before uh, a customer is onboarded. So at that particular point, you can see there's an intrusion into the privacy of a person when they're trying to uh, to check whether this person is actually uh, allowed to, to transact business with us. You know, there's the issue of uh, terrorism in East Africa, and uh, the government has come very strong that uh, for you to onboard uh, a customer, you have to make sure they are not in the red books. There, there's a... There's a risk around that space that we have to guard. When we get this information, what do we do with it? Then also under the claim processing, also uh, there are some risks uh, which we get there. There could be data leakage or payment uh, under payment processing. Again, uh, personal information like the banking details. If you don't handle that very well, that could cause a harm to the data subject. And uh, we know the kind of, the, the fraud stars would really be wanting to intercept this kind of data in order to profit in the bad way. So there are kind of risks that uh, you have to be cognizant uh, as long as you are uh, trading on this space. Then uh, data leakage of sensitive information like the medical data. Uh, anytime this data is being shared, the question is uh, what are the risks involved? Uh, would we have this information reaching people who are not supposed to private to this information. For example, I wouldn't want to know somebody to know my medical status if probably I'm HIV status uh, positive, for example. So to the data subject, this is very critical, yet this information probably is being handled by non-medics and it would go around there uh, spreading this information. So that there could be a risk there or some time, uh, let's take of the cases of the, the lady, uh, there could be a, a pregnancy test and somebody is actually uh, waiting to uh, bring in some, some new arrival and then somebody congratulates them. Uh, that information is very private. There could be some risk around this space because uh, you are not supposed to use that information for the purpose that is not intended to. You are only supposed to provide the, the medical, but you have no business uh, analyzing that information for your own personal gains or for the business. Then uh, also on profiling, uh, one kind of risk which we see here when people are profiling, uh, the risk is uh, uh, you could do some sort of analytics. Uh, let's say, let's give a case for, for, for the insurance. You profile and realize a certain region or a certain uh, group, they are prone to a certain disease maybe and that is not doing very well to the books in terms of loss ratio. So you could see either the premiums are loaded or they try to avoid uh, giving uh, insurance to these people. And you're actually denying these people a service and you're actually profiling them, which is not good. They, they are kind of being disadvantaged. So we see that. Then again, uh, the security of the data. Again, that's a challenge. As we're exchanging data, let's take a case of the insurance uh, it moves from the insurance to uh, smart and then to the health providers and way back. So we know of instances where this data can be trapped by a man in the middle attack. And uh, once they get hold of this data, uh, they use it for, for ransomware. So we have to be cognizant of the risks uh, along that as data is transiting from the insurance to smart, to care pay, I mean, to, to, to the providers, and it's on way back. So even as it sits uh, with the medical provider, even it sits with smart, there are quite a number of things that you need to do to ensure you minimize the risk of those data leakages. And also, uh, when we put our data on cloud, we also have to secure that. If we don't do that, then there are quite a number of risks that uh, we could experience uh, along that space. And uh, I'll give an example, like uh, if uh, you are storing your data probably within the EU, 
where most of us have borrowed uh, our our law, then it's okay because we know those companies are, are complying to the GDPR uh, regulation. But uh, let's take the case of the US where they have the Patriotic Act that allows the state to snooze on all the data. So the privacy there is a concern. So it's something probably you have to think, do you have control over, over your data once it is stored there? Uh, in cloud so you have to look at uh, the laws that are in place in the areas where you are storing your data whether they are in compliant with uh, our laws and if you have customers who probably are within the the gdpr region uh, are you storing the your their data in in a zone which is outside that that does not enforce uh, the principles that are contained in the gdpr so it's something that you have to to check. Then there is also third party uh, who are people you, you also work with who come into contact with the data. I'll give a, a very specific uh, a, a case uh, here in point here. Yeah? You, you probably think uh, there isn't much over this, but sometimes the cleaners, if they're moving around and they, they find their way into the registry and pick some very crucial information, you see there, there's a risk. So you really need uh, to be cognizant of that and make sure you have a bird's eye view of uh, the risks that uh, could come along in terms of where you, you place your data, whether it is a hard copy or physical. And then also we have the patients who are enlightened. So when they are, their data is uh, flashed outside there or probably use it for, for marketing, which is uh, outside the, the purpose for which you have obtained the data, then there are risks uh, that uh, could arise from, uh, from such kind of uh, misuse of data. So there are quite a number, but in a brief, that's what we have for you to do. Thank you. And you can uh, continue now. Thank you, Timona. Uh, and so, Joshua, I'm hoping we don't have questions and we can move to the next session. Yes, we can proceed the next session. So for those who will have questions, please put them in the chat. We address them once the presentation is done. Thank you. So we are now going to look at the typical obligations of controllers and processors. Uh, remember, those are the institutions that would ideally be interacting with a person's data or with a data uh, subject. So uh, this, I'm just putting them as general obligations. What you generally would find in data protection laws, uh, one of the things that um, is really big is the adherence to the principles of data protection. Um, most laws provide for principles, and then they say that uh, as a controller and processor, you should put measures in place to comply. Then they also talk about recognizing and facilitating data subject rights. Uh, they talk about observing the rules around processing of uh, children's information and also around marketing and promotions. The need for conducting data protection impact assessments. The need to achieve uh, data protection by design and by default or notifying authorities on breaches or even registration with the regulator, also known as data commissioner. And then some of them, most of them, most uh, regulations or laws will make a distinction between the obligations of the controller and the processor, especially around who appoints who. So the controller is the one that appoints the processor in most scenarios. Uh, the controller has an obligation when appointing the processor, uh, mostly to look at and ensure they are working with processors that already have safeguards for data in place. And secondly, to make sure that they get into written arrangements, written agreements of a very specific nature. Actually, some of them, like the Kenyan law, go into details around how the contract with the processor should look like. And then some of the laws also distinguish between reporting obligations. Who should report when a data breach occurs? Uh, typically, like in the GDPR scenario, in the Kenyan scenario, 
within 72 hours of a breach occurring, the controller is supposed to notify the data commissioner. Uh, 72 hours of becoming aware of the breach, especially where the breach has uh, results in a risk to the data subjects. Um, and then typically the, the responsibility of the processor is to obey the boss. The boss in this situation is the controller. They need to do what they have been instructed to do by the controller under the agreement. They do not they should not deviate from the agreement. And if they do, most laws say that when they do that, they will be considered as a controller and not a processor. So because of that, you find that processors, are, they are managed tightly, their obligations are looked at closely so that to avoid a situation where there could be risks that emanate from them. Some laws uh, say, that give controllers, I mean, sorry, processors, uh, the obligation to notify the controller uh, within a specified duration of becoming aware of a personal data breach. In the GDPR, there's no specific obligation of this uh, around notifying the controller within a specific time, but this is some of the things that, or some of the nuances that we see in the different laws. So it depends again on your country, but you do need to know what are the distinctions that are made between the controller and the processor? And what are the expectations when you're dealing with information related to a controller or a, a processor? I just want to run through those obligations I talked about uh, being the general obligations, what typically you would find and how typically organizations go about complying. So you would find that most laws talk about the principles of data protection, and they give the listing of uh, principles. They are different across countries. Um, what I have listed here is what is found in Kenya. It's what mostly is found in the GDPR, except maybe number one, which does not uh, exist within the GDPR framework. In Kenya, we have that number one, which is the respect for privacy, because it is the constitutional requirement under Article 31 of our constitution. Uh, but typically what you will find is that you are expected if you are a controller or a processor to handle data in accordance with the principle of transparency, lawfulness and fairness, with the principle of purpose limitation, which means you should have a purpose for every data you collect. You should minimize collection along with the principle of data minimization. You have to ensure that data is accurate. Um, you have to define retention limits. You cannot store data forever. That's what we call the storage limitation principle. And then there is the transfer limitation that if you're moving data outside of Kenya, or if you are using those cloud-based systems that Timona was talking about, then you have to make sure that your systems comply with the principle, with, with the requirements for transferring data that are in your jurisdiction. Generally, for complying with the principles, what most organizations have to do is first have a good understanding of where they sit with data, have what we call a record of processing activities or a ROPA or an inventory that actually shows you how you collect data, the purposes for which you collect it, the lawful reasons why, and you know areas where you possibly could be mini need to minimize or where you do meet the minimization requirements. For transparency, privacy notices are required at the point at which you are collecting data. So if you're collecting data through a form, if you are a medical provider and it is a hospital, you need to make sure that you, pro you put these kind of uh, privacy statements within your forms. And nowadays we do a lot of spot checking. When we go to most of these organizations, we are still not there yet in meeting this transparency requirement. If you're an insurance provider, your policy form, your proposal form should actually be embedded with a privacy notice. People should understand why you're picking their information and how you will use it. Fairness. Fairness means that you're giving individuals the highest level of control over their data by maybe doing automation or making it possible for them to access their policy, access their treatment notes, 
access their history with you through a tech a, a platform a medical platform so we are now seeing the advancement of telemedicine in Kenya we have interacted with a few telemedicine providers in this uh, jurisdiction as people are looking for ways to make it easier for the data manage the information or to see the information that you handle about them the requirement for you to have mecha checker processes at each stage of your process Processing activities speaks to accuracy, making sure your systems have been embedded with processes that ensure you don't have inaccurate data. And this is a big issue, especially with the pro between the providers and the insurers. How are you checking on your uh, accuracy and the accuracy of your records? We also have retention and disposal uh, measures being required. Do you have retention policies? Do you have disposal policies? Do they apply to your electronic data as well as your manual data? And then also being looking at what is my basis for transferring data outside of my jurisdiction? What does my law say? What have I put in? When we talk about data, typically, that's of rights that are highlighted as being data subject rights. You will be interacting with this, whether you are a provider, you're an insurer. How have you prepared yourself? Have you informed your data subjects that they, uh, they need to have information about how you're going to process their data? Do you have a policy around how you receive data requests and how you actually handle them or how you process them? Do you have in uh, a policy or a process, an actual process within your customer service processes that deals with requests from data subjects about their data? If somebody asks for a statement of account or asks for their medical report, how fast can you give it to them? Can you comply with the statutory timelines? Can you keep records of who asked for what and what was the response that was given. So this is the requirement here around re-engineering the way you are structured so that you can be able to be responsive to the type of requests that you are bound to receive from data subjects. How do you deal with uh, commercial data or using data for commercial purposes? When somebody comes to you for a policy or someone comes to you for a treatment, can you entice them with other services you provide by direct marketing to them? What are the rules and regulations? Most of the countries require that you need to have consent. You cannot just send direct marketing or direct communication to people without giving them uh, an opportunity to consent, and also where they have consented, have you given them an opportunity to withdraw their consent? So how are your processes structured to support those kind of requests? When we talk about data protection by design and by default, basically it's looking at the extent to which when I look at your organization from the outside, I can see that you by design, by through your processes or, or how I interact with you by design, you're meeting or you're complying with data protection. For example, if I make a call to your organization asking for a specific um, service, uh, maybe maybe asking for my treatment notes, will I just be given or do I have to go through a process where you are verifying my identity checking through who I am, then making sure that uh, you give the right person the right information. So by design, you have designed your processes such that they comply with data protection. And then by default, by default mostly talks about your systems. If you have an app or if you have a website where you're collecting personal data, by default is that system complying with the requirements for data protection. So there's a lot or required to achieve what we call by design and by default data protection. It means you have to do a lot of audits to understand what exactly it is you are doing and how you can improve uh, your systems, your security, your measure, uh, your, your transparency to comply with the principles of data protection, how you maintain confidentiality 
the nature of policies you have, information security policies and data protection policies, and then how robust is your training and awareness? Do people understand you are dealing with data uh, as an organization? When it comes to notification of breaches, what have you put in place? Uh, do you know your obligation? Are you a controller? Are you a processor? Do you have a process in place to notify of a data breach? Uh, and, and, and do you have an incident response plan when a breach occurs? How quickly can you investigate it and make a decision around whether you need to do an onward notification to your regulator? How quickly do you need to, uh, uh, to sit down and be able to have what we call stopgap measures, stop the breach from further occurring? Have you prepared for a breach the way you would prepare for a fire? That is the, the standard that is required of you. And when the breach happens, you are not supposed to be finding out um, together with the regulator. That looks bad on you. How proactive can you be to notify the regulator of a breach? And then um, how often are you conducting what we call data protection impact assessments? Basically your audits. How often are you auditing yourself from a data protection perspective uh, to make sure that you have identified the risks uh, related to how you're processing personal data and that you are actually closing the risks as and when they arise. Are you tracking your risks from these impact assessments? Who's responsible for uh, informing you that an impact assessment is required in your organization and who actually drives the process? So those are some of the thoughts that you need to have uh, in place. So as we think about those uh, maybe what I can say in closing, as you think about the law and what is required, is that you need to have a very good understanding of the law in your jurisdiction, and then move from just having a head knowledge of the law to a good understanding of your processes and apply the two, because it's really a test of your processes. How strong strong are your procedures from a data protection perspective and they can they stand uh, or can they withstand an audit even from a regulator. I will hand over back to Timona to take you through the last part of the presentation, which is how do you move from what I'm saying? How do you start? How do you start getting organized so that you can become compliant with data protection? Timona, you can take over. Uh, thank you, Anne. So basically, uh, here we are talking about uh, your roadmap, your journey uh, uh, towards compliance. So the first thing is to define a strategy. Now here, you will be expected uh, to have uh, to prepare a plan uh, of how you are going to achieve it. Uh, so you come up with a plan how you are going to engage, uh, what you need to do, all the way up to the end, because then that way we'll, it will help you to identify resources and uh, gaps. Then also in that, you need to also identify the stakeholders, identify the stakeholders. And then also uh, as a good measure is to conduct uh, a readiness assessment. Most of these things uh, you realize, uh, bits and pieces are being done. They are from a technology point of view, they are firewalls, there are viruses, uh, there are death loss prevention programs that avoid uh, stop people from sharing this type of data outside. So you kind of uh, realize sometime probably you have uh, checked the box maybe 50%. Also you have an organized uh, registry and you have controls around that in terms of who goes in there and who can access uh, the info around that area. Then uh, once you do that, uh, you could also go ahead and try to see if you'll also have uh, a champion, that is uh, the DPO, the Data Protection Officer, to help you navigate uh, and uh, go through the journey of compliance. Then uh, the next critical bit is uh, training and awareness. You first need to start with your staff because these are people who are the custodian of this information they need to be trained to know the aspects of data protection, 
uh, what they're doing, how to respond, and of course, uh, uh, how to safeguard the, the, that data, and in case uh, of a risk, how to contain it. So they need to be trained and to be aware of uh, how to handle uh, data breaches if they are to happen, or maybe sometimes they could be false they are positive, where people think something has happened, but in reality it didn't happen. Now you can imagine if somebody were to call the data protection uh, commissioner, and yet it was a false positive, you can imagine uh, the repercussions to the company. Then again, you also look at your stakeholders. I'll give a case of an insurance company for, for this case. You also need, uh, you have other third parties like the agents and uh, the brokers who will help you to bring these customers. They also need to be aware uh, of, uh, of the law and uh, the extent under which they're involved under the kind of exposures they could expose uh, the insurance company. Then of course you have your providers, health providers, the people who actually on behalf of the controller, they would actually be providing the medical services. They also need to be in the know in terms of uh, the scope and how they engage. And also, you also have your other pre-qualified suppliers. We talked of the cleaner who might find his way into the registry and uh, get some crucial information. They need to be trained uh, on the dangers and uh, what is required of them so that everybody is, uh, is aware of, of the law, the scope of uh, their work, and uh, the risks uh, that are around that space and how people mitigate. Then the next thing is uh, after that, you actually conduct uh, the privacy assessment. Now in the privacy assessment, one key thing uh, you need to know because uh, as you process uh, the, the data, then there are risks uh, that could be associated with those processes. So you need to create a register of all the processing activities that you do uh, once you, 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 you prepare your register, of course, uh, where consent is supposed to be obtained, you make sure. Where it is by contract, you also make sure uh, it's clear, uh, basically the purpose of that process. Also, if it is for legitimate interest and uh, all those other principles that uh, Anna talked about. So you look at end-to-end uh, -end, all the processes that you do and you make sure they are fit for purpose. Uh, once you finish with your register of activities, then the next thing uh, you, you also review is uh, the security measures that have been put in place. How are you identifying these people? Because uh, to the insurance company, one of their concern is uh, giving a service to none of their members. So uh, issues of fraud around that space. So, you have to make sure the people who are accessing that data are properly uh, identified. So uh, there are some of measures which you put in like two-factor identification to identify these people. Then uh, also some measures in terms of uh, you do not expose uh, information that is not necessary. For example, in the case of a hospital, somebody in the uh, uh, customer desk should not see medical information that probably a doctor would see. So you try to define the scope of the exposure of the kind of data they will be seeing. So uh, you look at uh, uh, that and also the organizational measures like restricting access to the file room, making sure there's a register of who has collected this file, when is it expected? So when you're looking for it, where are you going to get it? So there are uh, all those things you need to do. And then uh, in the DPIA, at the end of course, you are able to identify the gaps uh, of uh, what you haven't done uh, and document all those risks. Uh, and then after that, put in some mitigation measures and timelines and identify the person who would work towards closing uh, those gaps. So that is uh, what a DPIA would help you to do. When is it necessary? When a new system is coming in or there's a change to a process that affects personal data or probably due to an outcry, so a public interest that would force you to, to, to relook. Uh, 
Uh, then after that, uh, along that, you also need to review your policies and their procedures. We're talking of like the privacy notices, uh, also to your employees, you collect uh, some personal data and you process child data. So you need to, to look into that. There are issues about uh, integrity and accuracy of data. So you need to come up with different policies that would guide that. Some of you have some websites, so you also need to go and look at the terms and conditions and uh, the like. So you need to come up with uh, a number of policies uh, that help you to ensure you are safeguarding. Uh, also, you are safe in case uh, there's, a, there's a query or a breach, there, there's a clear process and uh, your customers are aware how to respond and they know what kind of data you are collecting and why you are collecting it, what would you use it for. So it becomes very clear. So you also need to do that. Then also you need to look at your third party. Uh, vendors. Uh, once this law came in into place, uh, the data protection, so you need to bring in some few clauses, or in the case of uh, most of us who are using the non-disclosure agreement uh, to cover privacy of data, but uh, with the advent of these laws that are coming into place, you, you fashion a, a detailed uh, data processing or a data sharing agreement or a joint controller in the case where that is applicable, that is speaks to the act and make sure you cover all the sides of the coin as far as that is concerned. So once you do that, then you engage them and make sure they, they sign and uh, now they are duty bound uh, by that contract that is very detailed. Then the next thing is uh, how do you respond to the incidents and also uh, the breach, if they are to happen, when the data subjects are calling, how do you manage all this? So uh, in most cases, we've seen uh, incidents response uh, that are geared towards uh, IT, but this has to be very specific to data protection. So uh, in case of a breach, for example, you need to know how do you handle that? Probably you want to inform your DPO, first of all, then uh, immediately with that information, you have to assess the scope of, uh, of the breach and the impact, how many people have, have been affected so that you're in the know. And then after that, uh, you need to notify the relevant parties. Uh, we hear that uh, the directors are the ones who are responsible in case of a data breach. So these are the people you want to let them know in good time, your management and also the DPO. And then the next thing is uh, once you do that, of course, uh, you have to, uh, that is at the beginning, then you need to do a deep dive to know the extent, how did it come about so that uh, you are able to stop it in the future. Then once you do the deep dive, you, you tend to identify the proper extent and then you contain it and do the notification and ultimately, uh, you, you do some monitoring. Once you have done uh, all your measures, you do monitoring just to be sure that uh, you are not hit by, by the same, uh, same thing. So you, you learn from it and uh, put in some measures. One of the things we would recommend, uh, you know, we, we put a lot of measures, but we all know that even the Pentagon uh, has been hacked before. So what do you do in this case? Because uh, not of our, all of us have the same budget in terms of mitigation. One thing we would recommend probably is uh, uh, encryption of data and anonymization, such that if the bad guys get to reach your data, your data is uh, encrypted. Uh, that's a good practice. So if finally they get there, then uh, they are not able to read it. So that's one of the measures we recommend around that space. Then uh, next, of course, uh, by law, you are required to register with the data commissioner, either as a data processor or as a data controller. And lastly, after you do all these things, you need to continue monitoring and evaluation. The environment is changing and uh, the law could also be amended. So you need to monitor, especially the areas of your gaps, 
and uh, also your training has to be continuous because uh, with good training your exposure surface is reduced so if the staff know what to do uh, you tend to mitigate quite a number of things so you continue monitoring you continue training and evaluation and uh, with that you you will do good back to you uh, joshua Thank you very much, Anne and um, Francis, for that uh, wealth of information. So right now is the time for um, questions uh, and answer. Allow me to begin off with um, just um, you know a, a case study that we can use, and this uh, will be for Anne. Um, in the in, in the event that I, as a data subject, um want to complain uh, maybe probably my personal data has been uh, sort of leaked and let's use the context of you know insurer and um, healthcare provider i give the same data to the insurer also the same data the hospital collects about me the hospital also of course stores uh, my diagnostic information um, and also passes the same to the insurer so uh, let's say I, I, I didn't want people to know that I'm HIV positive, but someone from the insurer, of course, gets that information because that is passed on to them. And it gets from it gets leaked from the insurer's site, not from the hospital. How am I, as a data subject, yeah, going to be able to prove that it's the insurer who leaked it, not the hospital? Yeah, as I because I want to go lodge a complaint to the regulator. Yeah but I do not know where it got leaked from, but I know that two people who have this information, the healthcare provider and my insurer. How do I go about that? Because that's a very big challenge in terms of data subjects proving that actually, you know, this happened by, uh, and was caused by so and so. Because we give our data to many people. Yes, so that's the first uh, question of the day. So I think uh, in, in looking at that specific scenario, the important thing to know for you as a data subject is, who did I give my information? So if you know you gave both the insurer and the hospital, but you're not sure where the leak came from, for you is to show that there was actually a leakage. There was actually a scenario in which somebody came up and said, uh, you know, they, they they told you your status because they had it from one and one or two places. So for you is to show that, that uh, you gave these organizations, you are not sure when or how it happened, but you are sure that this has happened and this is the damage that has happened to you as a result. And when you're making your complaint, it's just to have a good detail of the facts, who you took a policy with, who, uh, you know, or who you went to see or which hospital you saw, and then a detail around how, the information came to you, you know, like how did you come to notice that this is now in the public space? And then let now the two providers, the two controllers now come to their defense, either to accept or to refuse your claims with their own additional uh, evidence. All right. Thank you. Thank you very much. And, um, and then Timona, in the case of um, the processor now the, for example smart um if i see something that is not right being practiced from my controller who's the insurer uh, how do i go about it because we all know uh, that this is what is supposed to be done by law but um we realize that the controller is not doing their bit so how do you handle uh, you know such cases Simona, you on mute? Oh, sorry, uh, I, I was speaking on mute. Eh? I think from a technology point of view, uh, there is a list of uh, requirements that would have been shared to define uh, how the processes would work. So the best uh, that you do is, if anything is outside that, then you tell them this is uh, out of scope, and uh, you initiate uh, a, a change uh, request, meaning that uh, due diligence will be done, so you stay with the initial instructions that you are given in terms of how you're going to process that data, because that is what has been agreed. So any change to the processing must come through a due diligence process. So you ensure 
the way you enforce changes to, to the operations uh, of your application, say smart, is strictly governed by that process. So that in the event uh, of a breach or whatever, you have stayed within what was agreed. So you should never accept piecemeal changes that are not fully authorized by the other party. Okay, all right, that, that is quite clear. Um, and then the last uh, use case I want to look at, um, at and is in terms of the relationship between um, the data subject and the processor. Can uh, a, data, a processor reach out to the data subject directly? Yeah, for example, um, I, I have been collecting data on behalf of the insurer, well, let's say brokers, yeah, uh, and, but I, I'm doing it on their behalf. I'm not doing it on my own behalf, but then I realize I have another product um, that I want to sell to the to them, and I already have your information. Yeah, um, I don't want to go collect it afresh now on my own behalf. But as a processor, uh, am I allowed to go reach out to the data subject with the information that I receive from the controller, uh, and then also uh, sell to them, you know, my my, my other products? So that, 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 that is why I think those are the mischiefs that the law is trying to cure when they are saying that the controller has to be in control of the processor. So um, mm -hmm. whatever the processor is doing needs to be defined in the contract, yeah? The, the mm -hmm. limits of what they have permission to do. So if you leave it gray, then of course then now the, the processor cannot be held liable because they will say under the contract we have, there is nothing that stops me from reaching out. And that then brings you as the controller to bear the responsibility for mm -hmm. what they will have done as a processor. That's why you have to be careful and really word your contract properly. What can you do as a processor? And if you have to change what you want to do, it has to be documented. It has to be in writing. In fact, the way the law says it is that the instructions must be binding upon the processor. And if the processor then goes on a frolic of their own and decides to do things that are outside of the contract, the law will look at them now as a controller. They will stop being a processor and be looked at as a, as a controller. So the, the contract is the key to defining that relationship. If you don't define it well in your contract, expect those scenarios to show up uh, and expect a lot of... Um, uh, actually, it is for the controller's own good to control what mm -hmm. the processor is doing. You, the contract is a risk mitigation tool. So if you have a very poorly worded contract, you will end up in trouble because your processors will always be doing things and you will always be caught out and paying fines on their behalf. But if you have a very well worded agreement between yourself and your processors, you are able to see the areas of risk and we are able to cover them well, including putting uh, good indemnity clauses uh, saying that in the event you do these activities, we are entitled to recover from you uh, so that then they can take responsibility and know that there is a penalty that they can pay in case things go wrong. All right, so let's head into the questions. Um, I'm seeing um, a few. Some have come directly to me, some are in the general chat. So I'm seeing uh, um, one um, question saying, uh, if I may make a request, can we please have the slide shared with us? Yes, definitely. Um, we'll have a slide shared with you. There was also a request um, for you know the contacts of the people who are speaking. So what I would request is that maybe Anne, you can edit the presentation to have the contacts uh, for yourself and Francis, so that then when we are sharing the presentation, it has those contacts so that you can pick from those contacts. Yeah. Um, then another question I'm seeing is: Is it a must to appoint a data protection officer? For an organization. So, Anne, again, I think you can take that up. Yes, again, that is a function of the law that of your jurisdiction. So, um, most, uh, like for example, in the GDPR, there are some mandatory organizations that must appoint 
uh, a data protection officer. Uh, so if you are maybe processing data on a very large scale, you have to appoint a DPO. If you're appointing, if you're processing sensitive data uh, or you are involved in monitoring of data subjects uh, to a high degree, then you have to appoint. So in that in that jurisdiction, there are situations where it is a must that you appoint. In Kenya, and I'll speak to the Kenyan example, it is not a must. The way the law is, is worded is that you may appoint, but when you really look at it, it is highly recommended that you do. It is to a disservice for you, especially who handle large amounts of sensitive data or health data, not to have appointed a DPO. Maybe Joshua, you can tell us from your own experience in Uganda what you see. Yeah. yeah, so what we've seen across um, the respective countries in Uganda, in Rwanda, in Tanzania, and um, uh, even uh, one that has come up in Zambia is that they use the word may. Yeah, so it's not it's not it's not a must, um, but it's highly recommended, like you've said, because then you have a structured way of um, organizing or managing your privacy management system, because this is a continuous process. It's not a one-off, um, as um, I think Timona mentioned. It's a continuous process. You're not going to do it and then close the chapter because you, your business is evolving. Your processing activities change um, from day to day. You come up you come up with new products. So definitely um, all those uh, processes that you have need to you know, be coordinated with have the people who are coming up with the products and processes being the ones thinking about data protection. Um, it, it's usually now conflict of interest comes in, yeah, because the same person who is, you know, doing that um, cannot self, you know, uh, examine themselves or self audit, yeah. Okay, um, there's another question that has come up. Uh, what will be the ideal way to handle consent to, full, to filming and photography um, in open forums or events, um, we have had several suggestions, but none has been 100% uh, proofing. Yes, I, I think, and you can help us with that issue of consent. Yeah, that one, that one is an, there is no, um, what do I call it, foolproof answer in this mass market filming of people and, um, and consent. So, consent, remember, just the, the, the way the, the way it is worded is so, are uh, rigid in terms of the elements that somebody has to have given it to you. Uh, it has to be specific. It has to be uh, voluntary. So you can't tell them uh, if you don't want to have your photo taken, don't come in because then that again removes the voluntary aspect of things. So um, in the mass market uh, event, if unless you are willing to make sure you get everybody to sign off a consent form, uh, we usually advocate uh, if you're taking these pictures, you need to put them in a way that you cannot identify anyone within those pictures as one of the ways you can do it. Uh, the other way is expressly seeking consent as they come in. We have so many digital technologies that people can rely on now uh, as they are signing up. Maybe you can pick the consent at that point. The question becomes, how do you identify who gave you consent? especially because it is a huge event. But what we are seeing from the EU, because it's not specific and unique to us here, this challenge, is the positioning of their cameras and how they are doing the filming in these large events is very tactical. In fact, in some cases, they put people who are probably their employees in the crowd and who they have actual consent forms from so that they can be able to show those faces. But the other people, you cannot really tell from looking at the crowd who is the person that has participated or attended the event. But because of the technicality of consent, the way it is defined, it's difficult. It's difficult. It's, it remains a challenge. I'm not going to give you an exhaustive answer. It remains a challenge, one that it depends on the circumstances of your event and uh, analyzing and looking through. But I always say, is it worth the risk? Because the mass market is the easiest way for you to face a complaint from the data subjects. So is it worth the risk? Whatever you're trying to promote, is that picture 
what the risk of the fine. Okay. Hello, Thank I you. think I can also yes. uh, weigh on it. Eh? Yes. Th there has to be some bit of uh, creativity here that we're actually seeing. As, uh, as you walk in, when you give consent, you get some sort of a tag, yeah? something reflective. So the photographer is aware that this particular person has consented. So you take photos of those guys, but for the others, uh, either some of them take the picture of the crowd from the behind, so that then you cannot be able to work backwards and be able to, to tell this is who and who. So there, there has been such, and uh, in some cases, uh, because when you leave your contacts, you leave your email, they, if they think they want to use your photo, they'll write to you uh, specifically that uh, you are in this event, we want to use your photo. Do you consent to us using it? If you say yes, then they keep that as evidence and use it. If you say no, then that's where it stops. So we are seeing all this uh, creativity uh, as people are trying to, to juggle. Yeah. So there is no one answer to it, but uh, there is room to be creative as long as you finally have the evidence that you are given uh, uh, the consent, you are good to go. All right, uh, Timona, thank you. I'm seeing a comment on the same, um, but in events, organizers often distribute tags and categorize attendees based on sitting areas to distinguish between those who have given their consent and those who haven't. Maybe so you have those who have given consent in one area, so you don't, um, you only target on that, and those who haven't then in another area, so you don't, you know, take photos. But our next question is for you, Timona, to, to give us some thoughts on it. Can an institution have a DPO as the chairperson of the Data Protection Committee? And are there any demerits in this? Simona, you're muted. Yes, you can have uh, your DPO uh, as the chair, but sometime uh, you, you, you want him to be accountable to, uh, of, of course, to answer some other hard questions. So probably if, I, if I'm there and I'm chairing and I know there's something I've not mitigated, there's a chance uh, I won't press very hard on it. So mm -hmm. if probably there's a, uh, like a CEO, somebody who would be able to hold the account, the DPO, that would be much better. You know, human beings have interest. If I know I have not mitigated fully, I might even choose to omit that one. I'm not saying I'll do that, but then people have different ethics. So it will be far much better that in that committee, they'll, he or she will come to report, but there's somebody else to hold them to account to, to the integrity and to the timelines. Yeah, I, I would uh, yeah. prefer to have it uh, on such a model. I would also yeah. add that um, there is the issue of independence. Um, so, you know, the, 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 the DPO is almost like an internal auditor because uh, in, in as much as they help you to comply and they train you, the, uh, once you achieve the baseline compliance, they come in now to audit what you're doing, to adjust to, you know, to be the gatekeeper to and, and to make the relevant reports. And that's why they always say, they say this role reports to the highest levels of management. So mostly they report into like the audit and risk committee and the like. So many times they prefer not to take uh, that role uh, where they are chairing those committees and then having to sit and become now an auditor of the members of those committees and, and the like. So um, it, it all comes down to independence. Uh, if they take that role, how independent can they be in discharging their functions? All right, thank you very much for that, Anne. So we have um, another question that is about um, reporting of, um, you know, complaints. Are there avenues to report an organization, you know, for data policy breach? And how is the process handled to prosecution and compensation? So given there's a prosecution bit, and you can handle that. Yes, so... Avenues for reporting again de uh, depends. So I, I'm 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 wondering whether this is reporting internally or reporting to the regulator. If it is about an internal report, 
uh, let's say you have identified a data breach in your organization, uh, you need to have processes in place uh, that actually enable ex uh, that that breach to be reported and investigated in good time. So, and it is even worse <coughs> where you have third party providers like SMART here. Let's say the breach happens with SMART and then SMART has to report to you as the healthcare provider or the insurer that they have suffered a data breach. And then now you have to make a decision about onwardly reporting. You will be tested here by the thoroughness of your processes between the two parties. How thorough is your SLA such that from the time of reporting that the processor reports to you to the time you actually report to the regulator, you meet the standard timelines, which are the 72 hours. So it is, it is a matter of defining a very watertight service level agreement uh, with your service providers, if you have them who have access to your data around how to receive a data breach report and then how to make an onward report or how to cooperate in creating the notification to the regulator. If the question relates to reporting to the regulator, again, I will say it's a matter of uh, uh, jurisdiction. Look at what your different countries say. So, uh, for instance, in the Kenyan uh, scenario, we actually can make a report through the web, the web portal for the data commissioner's office. You just need to have all the details in place. Uh, you need to be able to say when the breach occurred, who it is affecting, what kind of a breach it was, what measures you have put in place since the breach occurred to stop further breaches, why it occurred, and so many things that you need to, uh, to fill in when you're populating a notification report. The only thing I want to say is there is this great temptation to keep quiet when you face a breach, and it's now becoming something that the regulator is, uh, is actually pointing out or sanctioning companies for, that when you suffer a breach, avoid the temptation of saying, how will anyone ever know? The, the, the way that most of the regulators are finding out is either through a disgruntled employee who then either goes to share the information with maybe the media or actually goes outright and shares the information with the data commissioner. It is worse if you kept quiet on a breach and it is brought to the attention of the regulator um, than if you became proactive and actually self-reported. The way the laws are structured is to encourage self-reporting. If you, the incident occurs, self-report, show what you've done and what measures you've put in place. That will go into mitigating any fines that you could be uh, facing for such kind of a breach. Okay, and, and just to add that, if uh, to report to the regulators, so for Kenya, just go to odpc.go.ke. Um, uh, for Rwanda, go to dpo.gov.rw. For Uganda, pdpo.go.ug. And um, uh, for Mauritius, uh, go to dpo.mu. Uh, those are the countries that currently have active regulators um, and who, who are very active and, you know, have put in place frameworks um, uh, and also guidance notes on how to handle data protection. For the other countries, that is still work in progress. Uh, so so um, they might also give guidance on how to handle complaints. All right. Um, then our last question um, is um, still on consent. Are we able to include consent on the invitation cards slash links um, when they submit details, submit details, that is, is, is that an outright consent? Anne, yes, I think this was this. all on the, it was all on the debate around consent. And I like yeah. that people are thinking of the innovative ways to do it. I'm always yes. saying, um, if you, if you can, identify the individual positively that they have actually given you affirmative consent yeah uh, you mm -hmm. can actually show then you are good to go i think the the point is are you able to demonstrate an affirmative action on the part of the attendee to come to 
the event. So if, for example, it's something to do with an email link, you know, you can tell because they will respond and they will give an affirmative yes or no, and you are able to tie it and you are able yeah. to produce it as evidence. If it is the issue of tagging people uh, and you put them in different rooms, it's the question of actually being able to show that that tag, you know, in the photograph, that person actually had the tag or the, because they could have wandered into that group. Uh, you know, maybe uh, uh, they could have wandered there when the photograph was being taken, then they can start challenging your consent. So if you can show that affirmative action on the part of the data subject, they actually took a step to say yes to you, then I think you're okay and you're good. But it is a matter of interpretation. It just depends on the circumstances of the case. I can't say this is how we should do it in one way, uh, but I can say that all those methods that have been spoken to uh, can be challenged. So you, all you need to look at is, have I met the elements of consent as I am seeking for it? There's, there's another question that has come through, um, and th this is for you, Timona. How do we technically achieve, uh, you know, um, the right to be forgotten? Um, as organizations, how can we honor this right to be forgotten um, in both uh, technical and process, uh, you know, in te using technology and the processes that um, are in our organizations? Okay, uh, in terms of uh, right to forgotten from a technology point of view, is uh, you should be able to expand the data so that there's no traceability of uh, that particular person. I think it is that simple, but then of course, uh, you must uh, be able to keep an evidence that uh, that is what they requested for. So in terms of uh, you need to have a place or a system that you're able to log in this request and then uh, system, anywhere you have uh, personal data, then you have a mechanism to confirm that that data is totally uh, expanded or totally pseudomized such that there is no tra traceability because sometimes you want to keep that info for purpose of research and uh, analytics. So as long as uh, you are able to do that, either totally expand it or uh, anonymize it in a way that uh, you cannot be able to re do some reverse engineer and be able to pinpoint to that particular person that this was the patient, this is what he was diagnosed of ABCD, I think then that way you'll have achieved. So as uh, you are looking at your systems, you have to make sure you have uh, processes or functionalities that when such a request is put in place, then it is able to do it in a way such that it achieves that. Totally wiped, wiped out or totally anonymize it in a way that you cannot be able to reconstruct it and identify that it is Francis that this data belonged to. All right, I'm seeing a follow up question, uh, but this is not uh, just around uh, right we forget it, but um, exercising of data subject rights. Yeah, and that means when it comes to uh, the processor. So if um, and, and just from the interpretation of the question is if a, a data subject reaches out to the processor and they want to exercise their rights, you know, accuracy, be forgotten and all those rights that the data subject has. What is the obligation of the processor? Now, in, can, I think in this case now you're looking at like smart. You're the member. You've come to us. What are the obligations of smart in such a situation? And yeah. So again, it depends. Uh, again, we go back to the law and what. Of course, I always say start from there. What does the law say? But then uh, going down operationally um, between smart and the insurance provider, for example, in this case, or the healthcare provider, there should be some sort of an SLA around how the request should be answered. It should be answered, of course, by SMART, but with some form of notification going back to the to the to the insurer or to the provider so that it's not just happening one way without visibility. Because remember the actions of the processor can visit the controller. So the controller wants to have visibility, wants to make sure they can still see uh, what is being done. And the best way to do that is through an SLA, where you agree what will be handled by whom, in what timelines, and how a reporting 
uh, mechanism will happen between the organizations. Yeah, because again, if we say that the, 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 the processor should not answer, you could risk, you could run the risk of delays some of these things are time bound. You have to answer within specific timelines. So if you agree between the two of you that you know these requests as they come, respond to them, but give us visibility. Maybe tell us in a certain week how many requests came, what were the nature of the requests, the type of responses that were given, the timelines for responding. I think that makes it more efficient. All right. Another one that has come through is um, what happens in cases where there is no uh, contract or data processing agreement between the processor and the controller. Yes. So, so again, what, what happens? The lack of contract is a is a violation of the law. So of course, if you're being if if a situation arises, usually these problems become a problem when you're before when the regulator. Yeah. <laughs> so when you're yeah. when you're before the regulator, if this situation arises and you're before the regulator, then uh, the question will be, first of all, you are not complying with the law because you needed to have the contract in the first place. Then secondly, it becomes very uh, difficult to claim you're a processor, especially the processor, uh, it becomes very difficult for you to claim you're a processor uh, in the absence of this kind of a contract. You would actually be taken to have been a controller and you would be you know, uh, facing these liabilities to the fullest extent of the law. But of course, the controller would also then be in trouble for not having given you uh, the contract. The duty to generate this contract lies with the controller. And please note that your processors are also your IT service providers. Your Google, mm -hmm. Microsoft, Amazon Web Services, those are also processors. What they have done is they have standard data processing agreements which are available in their portals. So if you're using any of those IT providers, including MailChimp, and all those, please look out for their data processing agreements, mm -hmm. read them, understand them, see if you agree with those conditions, see if they are in conflict with your law and try to engage those parties to see how you can come up with a common uh, agreement where necessary. And allow me just to, to follow up on the, on the same. Um, is there a, a difference between a data processing agreement and a contract? Yeah, um, and what is the must have of the two? Okay. Yeah, so of course, every every provider, I think in the normal business world, let me just talk about it that way. In the normal business world, every provider uh, will will have, you know, sub, they will need to at some point subcontract. And usually that subcontracting happens by way of a co contract. Um, now, that is a commercial agreement. That contract just spells out what I'm going to do as your sub, as your subcontractor, uh, my obligations, your obligations, how much you'll pay me, and the likes. Now, uh, it is expected that in addition to that contract or inside that contract, you will put what we are calling data protection clauses. So if your contract, your commercial contract, has data protection con uh, clauses that are tight enough. In, in the Kenyan law, actually, the nature of the clauses is actually outlined in the Data Protection Act. I suspect it's the same in most of these other jurisdictions. So you need to check those clauses I have met, have they met the requirements that are in the law? So if they have met, then that would suffice to be an adequate um, a data processing agreement, so to speak. But basically, it is that your commercial contract should either have included data protection clauses, which we are calling the data processing agreement, or it should have an addendum standalone agreement, which we call a data processing agreement. So you can do either of the two, but usually what guides you is the volume and the nature of processing that you're doing. The higher the volume, the more the need for a standalone agreement and the lower the volume. Some people don't do so much processing. Yes, they are dealing with personal data, but it's not to a high extent. For example, between smart and an insurance company like AAR, it would be prudent to have a standalone agreement. Yeah, But um, maybe 
if AR is subcontracting, let's say uh, somebody to handle, I can't think of uh, what scenario it would be, but you know, Applied I, I mean, yes, somebody yeah. who will perhaps be just uh, servicing your machines or something. Yeah, maybe even that could have a, a, a huge impact. So just look at whatever they're doing. Yes, they're interacting with data, but how big, maybe a training provider, somebody who's coming to offer training, uh, maybe on a one-off basis. That person might not really require a standalone agreement, maybe if they're doing a classroom training, but because they'll probably pick the names of people and, and for purposes of giving a certificate or something, you then put in in their specific contract, some data protection clauses. So it depends on the volume and the nature of processing, but the contents of the agreement are actually in the law. So just consult the law as you are preparing these agreements. Have them ready because now we are going, the way the regulations are moving, uh, we are now moving from baseline compliance, which most countries have been doing the last two, three years, into now audits you will start seeing regulator audits. And some of the things you'll be asked to produce in these audits uh, include those kind of agreements. So are you able to come up with them? Uh, are you able to, to show that each of your processors has an agreement? If they don't, that is a possible non-compliance. Well, thank you very much, Anne and uh, Timona. We Our time is fast spent, so we are going to get into now the last section of our parting shots so that then we can bring this to a close. For those of you who have questions, um, definitely we shall share the presentation, which will have the contacts for the respective individuals. You can reach out and, you know, um, engage further. So um, for the parting shot, we shall begin with Timona, then Anne, then myself as we bring this to a close. So Timona, your parting shot. Okay, uh, for me, my advice uh, to all of you, uh, the reality is here, we are seeing uh, quite a lot of people are also taking advantage. We are seeing some influencers who their photos have been used and now they are suing. So it's never too late. Uh, make sure you have a plan and uh, see how you can actually implement it. And uh, should you need some help, we, we are there, but the reality is we are living in that age. And as people digitize, the threat landscape is expanding. We see even the government is fully gone uh, digital uh, in one way or the other. So there is need for you to relook at your environment and make sure you have covered uh, all the loopholes. So that's uh, my parting shot. Just don't take it casual. It's a reality, and as long as uh, the data subjects are coming to see this as an opportunity, you see now that's a problem. When it is as, as an opportunity, they, they're educated, they are going to take advantage of the flaws which you should have actually uh, come up with a plan and make sure you cover them before they start uh, moving ahead of us. Thank you. Thank you very much, Timona. Anne? So I think, yes, I, I agree with Timona. My parting shot would be uh, for those that have started, have not started a compliance journey, to just embark on it immediately, just take the proactive approach here. That's what saves you money. That's what saves you from fines and costs and all manner of things. For those who have started, uh, is to see how you can mature your program, how you can get better, more innovative, how you can rely on technology to do some of the activities that um, Timona was talking about there, like how you can conduct your DPIAs using technology, how you can monitor breaches using technology. So getting better, maturing your program uh, as you get to the point of uh, waiting for these inspections from uh, the regulators. It will be an interesting time to see uh, uh, regulators looking at us from a process perspective just to understand what we are doing with data. All right, thank you very much, um, our speakers. From my side, uh, for those who have taken time to attend uh, this webinar, thank you. Uh, we definitely will do our part to make sure we share the presentation. Um, and like uh, uh, my colleagues have spoken, uh, compliance right now is no longer an option. 
um, and and you know the law now does not is not industry specific. What has been happening in the past is that regulators um, have been industry specific. So you find insurance has its own regulator. You have uh, healthcare maybe having um, its own overseer. But now this is global it, it does not it is not industry specific so it will not allow us or forgive us for not doing compliance we have the experts in the room we shall share with you their contacts please reach out to them to be able to help you thank you very much um and i we have come to the close of our webinar thank you for your time and for participating for those who have asked questions uh, we wish you a lovely day ahead and um, a lovely week ahead thank you bye